Everyone, today we have the honor, especially for me, to have Kids and John, and what can I say, an icon, a legend from the 80s, 90s, 20s, hard rock. And uh, this is a really a um, huge thing because we don't have many musicians that still play this pure and, and genuine genre. Hi, John, first of all, how are you? I'm great, Ada. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a My pleasure. pleasure to be here. Yes, Thank and you all... so much for having me. Yes, it's always a pleasure. And uh, of course, I want to start uh, with uh, the most common and interesting question because uh, people know not knows you for being uh, in Kingdom Come, in Montrose, in Burning Rain. But uh, before getting to Burning Rain, all these projects that I love especially, I want to just ask you who is Kids and John? Starting from your early career, I mean, just a uh, little excursus. Well, uh, let's see, in a, a short version of the story, uh -huh. I was a kid growing up around a lot of classical music and traditional music on the east coast of the United States in New York. New York. Um, and the area was Long Island, which is even a smaller and more specific slice in New York. And I was on eastern Long Island which is a um, pretty conservative area, kind of <laughs> like New England. Yeah. Uh, New England in the United States always had the legend of being conservative and, you know, old school, you know? So yeah. I grew up around that and that was very good because uh, I got a lot of influences, even from probably being a baby, you know, from uh, <laughs> yeah. Beethoven and Mozart. And, it's a classic uh, musical, yeah. And check out the, and, Weaburn and Strauss and like a million of them and uh, you know so I first as the kid I think I gravitated more towards like the Beatles with George Beatles. Martin and how they yeah they got just so, just the so Brit, the, the, the early Brit pop arranged songs you know yeah. with uh, all kinds of interesting string sections and horns yeah. coming in and out and great great melodies and yeah and sure counterpoint and stuff and. Um, you know, I really didn't know much about metal or even hard rock until maybe junior high school, you know, junior, junior high, school, high, high school, high school. Yeah, a couple people turned me on to you know, more of the U.S. bands, you know, Zeppelin and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, that Aerosmith, Rolling Stones, of course, the typical stuff. But I always still listen to Class music and folk music. I used to listen to a lot of Crosby, Stills, and Nash because you know I love their vocal thing, and I was a vocalist yeah. and yes, I was uh, a choir in school, so I appreciated that because they wrote parts like they were in choir. You know, they they really understood sure. how to do counterpoint. Who these folk bands from like the '60s, uh, like Woodstock and everything. I really yeah. passed on to that as a kid. I, I, it's another world, so and another era, in, yeah. Oh, I know. Well, later on in metal, first heard uh, Bring It On The Heartbreak by Def Leppard, and they did those Oh my god, amazing. Just like, kind of, yeah. Just like kind of the folk artist, you know, and then all the Europe guys, the Scorpions and everybody else who was doing yeah. all those great vocal harmonies, it, it really hooked me into the metal scene. I'm like, wow, now these yeah. guys are now cool and they're singing that really cool stuff that i love too so yeah you know the first um sort of heavy metal cover band i was in on long that's the songs i wanted to do you know we did i'm sure we did bring it on heartbreak and uh you know run to the hills and all these songs that have these sailing <laughs> yeah. choral harmonies in it so uh, you know that's kind of a little bit of my musical you know, taste in yes, show where just it comes from. the Harley influences we can say. Yeah, and the other thing is, is you know, I also grew up playing drums. I started playing drums. Your drums? Ah, oh, that's that's cool I to know. Played a lot in my parents' basement, you know, and I'd have 
people over, albeit from the classical orchestra I was in or the choir I was in, somebody, you know, I'd find someone yeah. who rock on electric guitar, come over and we'd sing and play. And that's how I got started, you know, learning these kind of songs. Yeah, and, sure. uh, Or, you know, developing my style and my influences of in course, a way that course. still affects what I do in Burning Rain and, and Kingdom Come and everything else right yeah. now. You know, so that that's so, how I'll always be there. So, and you were saying before about a band called Big Trouble. What about yeah. this big trouble slash big band? If I'm not, big if I, if I remember well. Okay. Yeah, that's a that was a band um, that was already together, already mm -hmm. signed to Atlantic Records, yeah. a subsidiary called Modern Atlantic. And they were looking for a singer. And they already so, had songs and they already had producers involved yeah. and they had gone through quite a process. And I happened to be, I happened to have some little thread of a connection with a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy. Oh my guy. <laughs> yes. And I actually, I actually made my first demo tape ever. Wow. And the first copy of it was on cassette. <laughs> the tape, the cassette. I put it in an envelope. And I left it on a doorstep out in Port Jefferson, Long Island. And long story short, in less than a month later, I was up in Atlantic Records at 75 wow. Rockefeller Center shaking hands with Jason saying, welcome to the band. And, you know, and um, that was the first taste of the music industry that I yeah, had ever. The first steps. So, and it was good. I learned a lot. Learned a lot from that project. And. Um, one of my really, really good friends today, who yeah. miles away from me now, uh, he finally bought a house in my neighborhood, uh, John Levin, John Levin yeah. was the guitar player also in Big Trouble back then. I had just met him, I didn't know him, and, and then I didn't see him for a million years after I moved out here from New York. New York. He didn't move out here, when, you know, took off basically before that project was really done. I took yeah. off and came to LA because other things yeah, yes, business true. happened. And yeah, anyway, because John in fact- we're really good friends right now. Yeah, but there are also, um, if, I, if, I rem big, uh, if I remember, there are also huge member in- the drumming heroes. I said that if I if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, there oh, there sorry. were huge uh, yes. The if I'm not wrong, there were huge member in this band. Yes, one of my drum heroes from Long Island, Bobby Rondinelli, who was with Rainbow. Um, he was in the band. He was well known in the musical circle, kind of like of course the king of the of drummers on Long Island. Him and a guy named, an uh, older guy named Joey Franco, who was the drummer in a band called the Good Rats, which you might not have heard of the Good Rats, but they were big in the New York tri-state area yeah. as well, big Long Island band. And uh, anyway, Bobby was in the band, John, who was a great, great, great gunslinger guitar player, and a bass player named Tommy playing guitar with Alice Cooper. Uh -huh. He was the other member of Big Trouble. So, as a, and so, there's a tall never, us, good, finished. good, by, good, big band. He it was good a great band. We never finished that record. That nah, damn it. But there's a lot of great sounding tracks sitting there that people keep asking me about. Yeah. Um, it, it's not up to me whether or not those can be released. <laughs> uh, but it was a great band. I learned a lot, and you know, I know the, uh, I know all through different circles now. Yeah, sure. Connect in sometimes. Yeah. And. Um, You know, the rock world and the whole world seems, as you get older, for everybody in every industry, I guess, to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, even even if uh, you know, there I, are um, oceans that divide you, countries, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm yeah. writing a song now. Really? Yeah, oceans that divide you. Yes, you're you're onto something here. I can write something and send it to you. <laughs> so, and uh, I read that you um, were on uh, like uh, on uh, on a guest as guest on uh, on on uh, an album called Guest List. Oh, 
Yeah, my, yeah. my buddy Mark Ferrari. Exactly. Yeah, what about that? So that yeah, Mark, really uh, impressed me because I didn't know. So when I read that, I said I have to ask me to ask him about this album called Guest List. I, you know, Mark put it together, and I sang us. I don't even know, remember how many songs I sang on. <laughs> uh, probably just maybe a song or two or, or yeah. something. And there was there were other really good singers on the record, like Robin McCall. Yeah, you know, great singers, and um, I was honored to do it. It was that was a quick, that was a very yeah. quick thing. That was one of these um, uh, project Mark did, which he had done many. Yeah, and he um, got a lot of his songs yeah. licensed on these records that he did for TV and film. Yeah. So I actually had a long run with Mark Ferrari with songs we co-wrote together. Somebody. Also on the Medicine Wheel record we did together, which yeah. was a band that that he started. Um, and we had a long run of all those songs being placed in yeah. TV shows, like on a repeat basis for years. And, and when something goes to syndication or you get something in a major film that does well, Yeah, you start getting some nice royalty checks from sure. from ASCAP and BMI. So, you know, we had a long, ongoing relationship, mostly with that. But it started with doing the Medicine Wheel band together. And um, about about Medicine Wheel, got, yeah. Yeah, Mark also got um, a drummer called Ray Luzier, mm -hmm. who's now been in Corn for quite a while, uh, a long while. Uh, who's a fantastic guy and a fantastic and um, guitar player named Danny Gill, who mm -hmm. I don't know if your listeners would be familiar with a band called Hurricane Alice. Of course, you know, Hurricane Alice. Alice. Of course, you're speaking to one that <laughs> not even the most, I don't know, underrated and unknown band from the 80s. Do you remember? I, I'm the, maybe one of the few that knows a band called Babylon AD. No one knows Babylon AD here. Few, but few people and a lot of band I can do uh, for we can speak about the 80s band for two hours. So, Hi. yeah, of course, I know how we can Well, Danny after. Gill, who lives in Europe now, he moved to Europe, got married and, and moved to Europe. A uh, few guys I haven't seen in many, many years, but he was in uh, Medicine Wheel with me and Mark and, uh, and Ray Luzier. And, uh, and I believe, was the bass player in Hurricane Alice, Ian Mayo? I believe he was in that band. Ian. Because Ian was the guy that eventually introduced Doug Aldridge and me, and that's what started Burning this, this, uh, We will go through that, but if I'm not wrong, <laughs> but because, of course, uh, you, you say that you, you were in uh, New York, then you moved in... California in uh, yeah. LA so there was uh, the, that was a period that we spoke a lot about that and I can speak about that period for all night you moved in a moment where it was like Sunset Strip uh, I don't know way of living it was like a load as the Sunset Strip you moved in an, in a LA how was I mean just tell to the people was your going through coast to coast in a moment where glam rock hard rock were like on the on the top yeah i guess um for me i in in astrology they triple fire sign so i'm a aries guy mm -hmm. with the leo rising and a sagittarius moon and you're all these, leo completely your your triangular sounds, fire sounds, yeah makes me um, makes me very active in the moment yeah like you throw me out of the plane and I, I will find a way out of it you know yeah. that's kind of always been my thing so to be honest with you when uh, I was asked to move to LA mm -hmm. to do uh, to do a project around my music I, I didn't even really blink an eye I never even thought about it I was completely ignorant. I didn't even know the whole business that was in, in LA, LA and yeah. what the scene was. I had no idea. But someone said, yeah, we want you to do this project in LA and we'll fly you out. And I said, 
LA, is that Los Angeles? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> pack your stuff. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Yeah, and I've always kind of been like that, you know? Yeah. You know, I said, yeah, I'm moving. You know, I'm moving yeah. the West Coast. Whatever. And uh, for me, I just, I take it all as kind of casual. And I did back then. And when I left, my mom says to me, so so you're really leaving? I'm like, yeah, I told you two weeks ago. No, no, no. <laughs> you want to go... I don't, I don't get all worked up about it. It's no big deal. <laughs> but and I didn't was, wind up staying out here. Yeah, so of I course. Just, and I was the scene back like then. I was the scene then when you arrived. The scene was on fire. But uh, it, it was, was what scene. I wanted to hear. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely on fire. There That's was supposed a, to be amazing. There was a place on Long Island that I used to drive about like an hour and 15 minutes in what? towards New York City, but not mm -hmm. all the way in, called Spit. And they only did Spit on Thursday nights. But the scene was all kind of metalhead people. Yeah. But, but they had like a dance floor and, you know, they play all the real danceable kind of like, yeah. you know, I don't want to embarrass myself, but, you know, they play like all the sort of Aerosmith and Kickstart yeah. My Heart and yes, all that yes. stuff that you get out there and boogie to. This do. music, this kind of music is danceable. I know. Yeah. Like From Alice Cooper, element, yeah, Motel Crew. You know, for us, yes, for, for us out there, you know, um, this was still this was still pretty hard and heavy, you know, for, for the scene yeah. and what's sort of New England and conservative <laughs> for us, to, you know, I'll be in leather and long hair and go out, you know, pounding Jack Daniels and dancing on the dance floor and partying until, remember, in New York, bars don't close till four o'clock. So we're partying until five in the morning kind of thing, <laughs> you know, sunset, that's the way it is. Sunset, uh, another, tip, so like, another so type around, of sunset you know, pool bar. This, like, this is a once a week thing, mind you, you know, that all of us who go there kind of look forward yeah, to it. Sure. And, um, and it's but you don't see this anywhere else in that area like you, you can't find that crowd or a club doing that another club yeah so in, in new york city in, in drips and drabs but um, yeah there was a place um that was more for live bands called the limelight mm -hmm. used to play, uh, more for live more gigs yeah but that was going to watch you know? this was yes. going to hang and party right yeah. so when i when i got to la on a saturday night um it was the strip was just bumping. It was pounding. I mean, I walked out of the car. And the, the guy who dropped me off just took off, went to go park the van and come back. And by the time he got back, I had met like, you know, I already met like 20 people. I was playing Miss Pac-Man's Lemmy and, you know, grabbing drinks off the bar and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it you know, was it like, was, it was like strange. Yeah. It was all that. It was, it was what I came from. And spit on Thursday nights, but multiplied by a thousand. <laughs> oh my God! But it's supposed to be something uh, unexplainable, as in, unless you're there. You're there. You just had to be there, you know. And it didn't last. It only a couple of years from then, maybe a year from then, or a year and a half, a healthy yeah. way. The thing is, is. L.A. was such a mecca of the 80s metal bands from the strip scene. Yeah. The strip held on for a couple of years after grunge kind of took over the radio. Yeah, the I remember, yeah. For a little while. Yeah, but you know? unfortunately, uh, I'm yeah. I'm grateful for that because I got to experience it. Yeah, something you know, cooler uh, that you remember? Something cool? Cooler that um, you remember some episodes, some I don't know something that you remember funny of that uh, that year post. We uh, can say in the grunge era. Gosh, man! Oh, in the grunge era. Yeah, being uh, being uh, on the Santa Strip at the same time at the same time. So living in that moment, but with the with the coming of the grunge music. Um, there was a member of Alice in Chains that was over my house, over my apartment one night in the Franklin Towers, that had to get the, um, 
had to have his heart restarted. So that's a massive episode that I remember. <laughs> um, wow. Now the rocker guys, you know, yeah, the rock, the long hair rock dudes, you know, looked at the model of Alice in Chains, and a lot of the metal bands tried to sort of convert their sound yeah. into sort of that direction. And um, and that's what I think the intent was with uh, the Medicine Wheel band project that Mark put together is that just they kind of liked. If, if the band was going to have part of the new sound that worked out with these new sounding bands, yeah, they yeah, wanted to kind of lean in that direction a little bit more towards the Seattle, you know, the Alice the Seattle, Chains, where yeah, had heavy guitars and whatnot. Yeah, but um, but but then you, after some years, I mean, before going to speak about Montrose and Kingdom Come and Burning Rain, I just want to know how you met the huge. Doug Aldridge, because he's uh, one of the biggest guitarists in the whole world. So, how did I mean how this friendship started? Well, after the Medicine Wheel project, I started my own thing, um, mm -hmm. and then that's generally, you know, I'm I'm usually running a lot of my own mm -hmm. stuff and doing my own Keith this, projects. This is the best and stuff. thing, yeah. Like now, I'm working. John Rack guys that I have handpicked. Yeah. And at that point, I started my own band. And I um, I always wanted these bands that I started as a piece of art to yeah. be ready when I decided they were ready. Yeah. I was never that concerned with the business, which is probably, probably. Yeah. Because the first St. John band uh, from the early 90s, if I would have taken one of the deals we were offered. And the same thing with the Crushed Flowers band. I had a sort of grunge band called <laughs> Crushed <laughs> Flowers after the Medicine Wheel Project. And it had a lot of those Beatles influence changes yeah. and stuff, kind of the way Cobain had all that stuff. Cobain had those really basic, cool Beatles changes and melodies. Yeah. And I kind of had that as well. Um, maybe a little bit more towards the middle Beatles slash yeah. ELO kind of a mix, and, a uh, mix, a mixture. We can say. I was always doing so much and having such a good time. You know, I wasn't in a rush to like, yeah, you know, and have my package and all that. But I had a great time along the way, and um, so I put this band Crush Flowers together, and had met Ian Mayo. Because he was Danny Gills from Hurricane's yeah. roommate. They, they lived in an apartment together on my street on Moore Park in Studio City. And Ian came out and jammed and tried out yeah. with me and my drummer and my other guitar player for Crush Flowers. So now Ian's in Crush Flowers and we worked on that project for a couple of years. Just having a good time together, writing songs and playing some shows. And during that... Um, Ian told me, hey, I got a band that I was playing with for a while. Looking for your style, like from the, the older stuff, you, the St. John stuff you yeah. did. It's like right up his alley. Do you want to meet up with him and check it out? So Ian happened to have been the bass player in Bad Moon Rising. Bad Moon Rising, yeah. Uh, and so he had been in Bad Moon Rising and Crushed Flowers. He introduced the two of us. Um, the first ones we we song together, and they sounded great. That's amazing. We just uh, it was in his backyard. Uh, he has a little studio out in the pool house in the back, and we we demoed up three songs. We sent them into Pony Canyon, was our label in Japan, and they were interested immediately. And uh, that was that. Burning Rain was born. Burning Rain was born. And it was just uh, natural for Ian. To, yeah, and Burning you released. Rain was born. It was just natural for Ian to be in the band. And you released two albums, um, Burning Rain and Pleasure to Burn. Yes, pretty quick. Yeah. And well, I mean, there is something that is going on about Burning Rain, something that you want to move, move on, make some new albums, music. Because there is someone in Europe that wants to know more about Burning Rain. <laughs> yeah, 
you know, I've learned over the years, we have this, I don't want to say invisible because they're very visible, but you know, I don't always know they're there because yeah. if you're not touring and you're not promoting it, of course, of course, you, you know, can. you don't really have an opportunity yeah. to connect with the fans. But there is a really good, I'd say, a strong cult fan base for Burning Rain. I know, I know. Because every I, time we do make an announcement that we're doing something, they are I there. See these, yeah, I see these diehard fans that are just really, really into it. Yes, because and, because as I told you before I started the interview, uh, when I listened to Burning Rain, for me it was like listening. You, to some bands like uh, they were from the ace straight from the 80s 70s 80s that i was like what well, i mean and then and youtube told me they were like of uh, 2000 and i was like what the fuck it's, it's possible it's possible because the sound uh, the the riffs every every piece of the songs is like they have the soul of the 80s and this is what I think this, the music of 2020 needs because this music is basically that disappeared from the world. There are too many heavy metal bands and extreme bands. They maybe forgot the roots of the music, like the hard rock, for example. And I want to listen more bands well, like I think, that. Um, I think I, you know, I have to. I agree with you as well. I mean, I like all different kinds of rock and different kinds of metal and even yeah. different kinds of music. Yeah, sure. Um, even some jazz and whatnot and everything. But I do feel that there's, I don't know what to call it, there's a spark element, there's a fun element in yeah. the Burning Rain sound. Um, yeah. Maybe I don't hear a lot of other bands doing. We really <laughs> simplified our song um, arrangement style yeah. on this fourth record that we did recently and um, people seem to respond to it really well and yeah, added because, a lot of new fans. Yeah, because especially the new kid, the new, you can say, the new, the newbie fan that where they listen, they, they maybe listen Burning Rain and they have, you know, that curiosity to find out what is behind and they see you and they listen to what you did they see they got the Galdrich and the other and then they found out there is a whole world behind all of that music and this is should they people should should listen more to this music when you say Eric and Alice not everyone knows these bands and this is really a best a settings because they are they were really good good bands and except for that band, because when I interview a band that I, for being for being correct, I don't want to say the name. They were one of my favorite, we can say hard rock band. I interviewed them, and uh, they made they have only one song, one video. And I was speaking with them, with the, with him with one of the band, and he told me that all the video and all the songs, their image was planned by the label. I was like, what the fuck? So how many bands from the 80s were like, uh, were like, I mean, were like, uh, we can say, um, made by the label? So the art rock and the glam was like fake. I was like, what the fuck? I mean, this song is one of my favorite. But of course, you know, the like now the la the label sometimes told you what to do, and maybe you want to do something more. But for getting to the the um, the market you have to do maybe dead things. But there are other bands, and for me, these bands are the band that didn't last too much in the 80s, glam rock, we can say glam metal. They made one album, maybe just disappeared because maybe they didn't agree with the label. And I have much respect for that band. Uh, but now, you... Well, you know, and the other thing is, you gotta look at it from their standpoint of view as a label, the owners of the label, they're operating in a time where the way yeah. they make their big money and they can survive as a as a big huge, yeah. you know business is they have to sell CDs or back in the day albums. You know, in order to do that and cover their bets, they're going to spend money making expensive yeah. videos for band and everything else. They need to make sure that yeah, of course, songwriters, great lyricists, that they know 
Yes, or, of course. You know, but so. now, just let's speak about Montrose. How did you get in Montrose? Because they are a huge project. And of course, now we will get, we will go through about speak about Kingdom Come because I remember that uh, the last interview we did it, you have to do something with Ki Kingdom Come. So just uh, going through Montrose and Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come, one of my favorites. So just uh, okay. what's going on between, uh, well, I started with Montrose. It was, uh, yeah, it was during the, I believe it's the first Burning Rain record we were recording, and we had a keyboard player come in and play on some nice. stuff. There's a, there's a few keyboard parts and whatnot on, um, on the first Burning Rain record. Uh, I think uh, You Can't Turn Your Back on Love it has some keys on it, and there was some yeah. other stuff. And um, that keyboard player guy, he, uh, he had been longtime friends with Ronnie Montrose. And once again, somebody you know whispered in my ear and said, hey, I know this great guitar player. Um, he's looking for a new singer. And that, that was while we were doing the Burning Rain. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, what's it all about? You know, and really the guy just wanted to, someone to write some songs with and stuff. It wasn't like starting a band or anything. And he told me who Ronnie was, who Ronnie Montrose was, because I'm from New York and we didn't... Montrose wasn't really, it was more of a West Coast, yeah. California sensation when they were out. And you had to be kind of deep and knowledgeable about rock to know Montrose yeah. if you were from New York, because New York just had its, its own playlist. <laughs> yes, this is something that one, uh, I think for, it's a, it was a, man, a musician from the Bay Area, uh, so trash metal he told me that even if it come from you know when you are from new york and you go to the west coast you are able to understand that the that musician from the west coast you can you can see they are not from the west coast or the east coast you are able to see because they are different even in smaller things but you if you are from the east coast you you can see they are from the west coast Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so it, it was right, yeah. 100%. So, uh, so I got together with Ronnie Montrose just writing songs. We, I'd go out to his house, mm -hmm. or he'd come to my place. At the time, I was living in Hancock Park, Los Angeles, which is a really shishi kind of, <laughs> it's the old Beverly Hills yeah. um, near Larchmont Village. Anyway, um, he'd come out there sometimes. And... You know, I still have tons of recordings of us sitting around writing songs. That's and amazing. We did that for a while. Uh, maybe, I don't know, a year we were doing that stuff. And, but within a year, Burning Rain had put out the first record and yeah. a tour came and went in Japan and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and somewhere along the way, Ronnie uh, was offered, let's see, put this. Well, the, uh, a guy Ronnie knew uh -huh. and kind of grew up in the Bay Area around, once he was out in the Bay Area, uh, Scott Bure was Steve Miller's manager. And uh -huh. Scott is still Steve Mil Miller's manager right now. He gave Ronnie a call and offered to manage Ronnie if he put together a new Montrose band and restart Montrose. Um, for whatever reason, Ronnie hadn't done Montrose first, and legends, you know, legendary stories come to me like he wouldn't even play Rock Candy, you know, when he was yeah. doing a lot of his gigs on his own. He just wanted to play his own instrumental and jazz and yeah. stuff. And anyway, for some reason, as we were working together, he snapped out of that and wanted to do Montrose again. Montrose again. So, so uh, he he said, "Hey man, let's just get a, a bass player in Germany." He goes, "I know a bass player and and a drummer, and, and we can just get together. If you want to check out some of my old songs, and he gave me recordings because I'm not that guy. I told you I'm a triple fire sign. I'm in the moment. So I never even went and researched him and listened to the old Montrose records. I just you know I'm doing my thing, right? So yeah, the first time I heard. Montrose tunes was learning the songs to go 
Like, it's yeah. studio in North Hollywood. Um, I believe Chris Frazier, uh, who played with Burning Rain later, Chris Frazier was a guy that Ronnie happened to know, and he came down and played drums that day. And we got a bass player. And 30 seconds of, of one song, probably like Rock the Nation. I learned like three or four songs, and <laughs> Ronnie said, sounds great, man, what do you think? I said, it's great, man, feels good, let's do it. And we split, that was it. And uh, then when we were when we were leaving, he said, hey, do you have any guys, you know, that, you know, that would be good for drums and bass? So yeah. he goes, because, he goes, you know, all these guys around town. You're an LA guy, and you got you got it going yeah. on. He goes, I'm, I've been of course. seen forever. He goes, I don't know anybody. So I called Pat Torpy, best drummer I knew on Pat. Yeah. And, uh, and Chuck Wright, who was working with Pat, because uh, Billy was on a leave of absence for Mr. Big. Yeah. And Chuck had been filling in for him with Mr. Big. So those guys have been working together. So, I mean, they came in. We did a couple rehearsals in North Hollywood, and. We went out on the road, did a Montreal gig. That's amazing. You know, and uh, some moments that you remember of being in Montreal. Some, you know, some moments, some funny moments, some I can say some emotional moments. Something cooler that you remember of being in Montreal. Something cool. Uh, okay, let's see. The first gig we did was at a place called Great America, up uh, up in Northern California. Sorry. And it's an outdoor bleacher seating kind of yeah. thing. And uh, I may have told this story in an inter interview or two before, but um, I came out in the first song, I think it was Rock the Nation, <laughs> swinging the mic like Roger Daltrey, you know, like during the guitar solo, after I was done with the, the second chorus, you know? And the mic literally went flying off the cable out into the audience. So I was going to be without a mic. But there was no backup vocals and there was no other mic up there. It wasn't spare. Luckily for me, a dude out in the audience actually caught the mic. I didn't notice it. And I, people were pointing at him and going, look. And I was looking and I go, oh, he's got the mic. And I was like, throw it. That's amazing. You made the perfect throw, lobbed the mic back to me. I, you play baseball, you play, you play, you play. In the new band. That's right. I think really spasticated that could have like been really embarrassing happens. But it got totally saved and the mic came back in time for me. I caught it like a champ, you know, and put it back in. Yeah, I like it. Came like, in with like, like baseball. Person. Yeah. That was a funny moment, but it worked out. You know, but it really made the crowd love us even more. They yeah, really because it was, yeah. they saw a spontaneous moment. Charged. They were already charged because Northern California, the Bay Area, is Montrose turf. Oh, so Ronnie coming on and actually playing Montrose again. Oh, deal. And what about Kingdom Come? Because Kingdom Come are like, we can say, huge, huge, huge band. And uh, we left some several months month ago that you were in a studio with Kingdom Come. Because the last interview was in the studio of Kingdom Come. So what about, what did you do at the time? And how did you did you get into, into Kingdom Come? Well, uh, okay. Got a couple of stories on this one. So, uh, when I was in LA in the early days, when things were still on fire on the strip, the grunge was coming in, and a lot of the '80s bands that are bigger, bigger bands, um, yeah, and Poison, and it's it was shifting around. Members were leaving, or certain guys were getting fired, or yeah. everyone was wondering what to do when reforming new projects. So there was a lot of those bubbling projects going on. I'm going on. Sure. One of the guys that called me a lot was James Kotek because he joined CeCe's new project, CeCe DeVille's new project, uh -huh. um, back when, I don't know if CeCe left Poison or if they fired him. I don't know what happened, but for whatever reason, CeCe and the rest of Poison, Poison. parted from each other. Yeah. And Poison got, um, was it Richard Patson back then? Yeah. I don't know, Poison. So Poison had another guitar player. And James kept calling me, hey man, you want to check out this thing? I, I heard your demo tape around town, sounds really good, man. 
come on up to Cece's house, man. Just on the way down to your down to the strip, man. I know you're busy and stuff, but just check this out. And I kind of know a bunch of times, but then I finally sure. went up and checked it out, and we jammed. Um, and it was a good jam, but at the time I was already in a band called Sun King uh -huh. with Rudy Sars and John Five, and we were doing that, and that was already signed to Giant Records. So I was doing that project. And just for me, it was just for fun. You know, I don't know what it is, just meeting more new people and checking things out. Yeah. Um, went to CC, checked out their project. And I was too busy at the time to do it. But that's how I met James. And then there's one in a while, James would give me a call and go, hey, this is going on, you know, you might want to do it or, or, or oh. my band's doing this, maybe your band wants to open or this or that, you know. Stuff was happening over the years. And then what's weird about this relationship is that somewhere in the middle of all that stuff, oh. James actually worked with Ronnie Montrose and did a Montrose record. Ronnie actually hired him. James played on, I'm not sure which record. It's one <laughs> of those, it's kind of those lost middle Montrose records yeah. that you don't hear much about, but um, it's all that stuff is still really, really great music. And I encourage people to, to go to listen, listen to Warner yeah, Brothers sure. present all those other Montrose records because they're fantastic. But James had actually worked with Ronnie, um, which was kind of, sort of his first break into the business. I didn't even know that for, for a lot of years. So uh, many years goes by. Once in a while, I come for whatever reason. But this time James calls me up and he says, uh, he says, we're thinking of getting the original members of the Kingdom Comeback together. Wow. Um, the original guys. And the original guys from the US, you know, who did the videos and stuff and were in the band in the beginning, had together yeah. since then, since the first couple of years that Kingdom Come, like 88, 89, yeah. 90. And then they kind of disbanded. So he's like, oh, cool. And I was, you know, as a singer that's been asked to do fill-ins before, I have to ask the same questions. You really got to ask your original singer, not just once, not just twice, <laughs> if he wants to do this. You know, because if he wants to do this, that's who the promoters are going to want. You know, and that's the best thing for the band. By and large, if you can have the original members of the band, that's always the best. Yeah. So they asked Lenny, Lenny Wolf. He said, nah, he's retired. He said, I'm retired. I retired the name, you know, a long time ago, yeah. a, couple, a couple of years ago. Like two years before that, he had retired and made a big announcement. And, and said, said that it. It, it's going to be out. Yeah. So James kept talking to me and I listened to the songs. Um, they sent me, you know, a really quick uh, instrumental, some, some bed tracks bed, they did in the track. studio. Yeah. Of, and I went to my studio and just kind of grabbed a 58 and live sang over the stuff and said, yeah, this feels good. This is right in my wheelhouse. It's We got the yeah, same influences, sure. the whole Marriott, Robert Plant, all that, all that yeah, stuff, you know. The, the, so, they, are, they are amazing. You, you the, the sound is uh, pure 70s. So we, I love it, man. I love it. And, and uh, we kept being, and management was coming together and a potential tour skeleton was coming together you know and in six months i said do me a favor call lenny again and you know really you know put the question across man say we're gonna again. do this tour and we're gonna go yeah. out and we're doing it it's happening are you sure you don't want to What's... you know and once again lenny, lenny turned it no. down and he gave us blessing he said man that's that's cool we'll just work out something so you guys can use the name live and all that It was, and they worked that was out. nice. Yeah. And um, the Kingdom Come 30th anniversary reunion tour was born. And yeah. uh, you know, it's tough. It's, it's a little bit tough on, not on me, because I don't, everything just rolls off of me. But <laughs> I know it's tough for fans. They haven't seen a band in that many years. And the singer is the guy that's not going to be there. Yeah, so, I mean, but you've, you know, been, you've been basically but, but I, in, in a, a lot of project bands that it's impossible to settle you in one band because i can say i, I can't say i have any i had an interview with kids and john from 
Born and Rain. There is too many um, project bands that it's just you. You can say I, I can I can say uh, I have an interview with Kids and John. So I, I also read, if I'm not wrong, that you had some project even with David Ellefson. Some. Well, David was in Montrose for a while. Da David Ellefson, really? David, From... Dave Ellefson was the bass player, and while he was playing bass, Jimmy DeGrasso was the drummer. Yeah. And you know Jimmy from all the bands he was in, Ozzy and yeah, Alice yeah. Cooper, Suicidal Tendencies, and Megadeth. Yeah. Uh, so those guys were actually the longest lasting rhythm section. That was the longest lasting version of the band. Wow. We played a lot of shows together with, with Dave Ellison and, yeah. and Jimmy DeGrasse. Yeah, that's my big quite. But if, if, for example, we have to, to uh, just with a, an, an objective, just um, a word to describe your career, which word you, will you choose? Um, one word. You're having a little bit of audio on my end, but I think I get the question. Yeah. Uh, one word to describe? Your career. My career. Yeah. Well, now you see on the side, I've, I've done other sides while the music's been going on and stuff like that. So for me, I just look at life as life and I don't go, oh, that's my career. That's, <laughs> I've always been a little bit of a hippie that way, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of falling into situations. It feels good to sing this music, so I'm having fun yeah. singing this music. Of course. It feels good writing with this, this person. That's why I always love writing with Doug, because when we get back, you know, we've got this click when we write. Yeah, the feeling works, with you know? that, yeah. You know, and, you know, with luckily with music in the career, um, it's acceptable to get back together with your old flame again and do it yes. again, you know, <laughs> your personal life. You, you can't do it. I, 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 I was saying that you can't do it in your personal life. With and music, we music. can get back on the same page. We can make love again, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. fine. So, uh, it's been a charmed, you know, road, really. Uh, you know, I haven't had to have that many days waking yeah. up and do something that I don't want to do. And so and I've been really kind of blessed that way. And um, yeah, we spoke about all of your projects and bands, collaborations, but of course you have, you have some musical influences on your own that forms yeah, you yeah which are oh musical influences yeah well like i was saying in the beginning classical music you know it got embedded into me early yeah. on so certain types of structure with um um a little bit of interesting counterpoint and these kind of things interesting shifting harmony structures and stuff yeah. that you know, I, I I gravitate towards that stuff a lot. But then there's the groove, which is a whole other thing. You know, being really into drums, uh, I also played as a classical percussionist and a timpanist. That's how I did my first, uh, that's how I got out of this country on my first tour overseas was playing timpani and percussion. So I have a thing for rhythm. So, for rhythm, yeah. You know, that, that kind of really turns me on too. So, um, hmm. It's tough, man. People will say, oh, what's your favorite band? And it's really hard to say. Oh, not like probably said, your favorite band, but just even just, I don't know, if you think at your at you and maybe who formed you in all these years, which comes, I mean, straight into your mind, just without thinking. I mean, even, I don't know, the first three bands, first three genre, just go I ahead. Can, I can get lost in Led Zeppelin for a year, you know, and just listening to songs yeah. like Friends and Battle of Evermore and some of these kind of deep cuts, you know? Yeah. They've got the eerie thing, but they also have the cool classical thing yeah. behind it too, you know, with John Paul Jones's influence in pages and all of theirs, crazy. 
Um, being a huge fan of Buddy Rich, I could just sit and listen to John Bonham for days. John Bonham, yeah. He's one of the few drummers in the rock that ever got that, you know? Yeah. Um, but then again, I can get into Andrew Lloyd Webber and sit there and just it's, it's a... listen to the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack <laughs> five times in a row and love that. So, as a classical. Anything with really the musical substance, you know, that, um, I can really get deep into it and just hang yeah. with it. And speaking about... So, yeah. So hard to, uh, to, to nail down a, a definite one influence, you know, it's hard. Yeah, and speaking about what you are doing, of course, uh, we everyone knows that right now we are in a tough situation for making anything in the in any field not only in the music field but what are you planning right now in for the nearly future or for the future i have had the saint john record in production since Re well before COVID, and Good and an album's worth of songs so um i'm getting ready to do basic tracks actually down at nashville okay. N Nashville, uh, the, the Nashville what? is uh, one of yeah. the city of the music, the soul. Well, I don't want to start name, not at that stage, but uh, there's a few people that are in Nashville who are, yeah. I'm close bros with and that are music and, and other things, engineers and whatnot. And, um, and I started doing a couple of projects and then I sort of turned on a few people to the St. John thing and they're like, wow, we re really want to be involved with this. This is this is great. And I was really It's surprised amazing. without naming names who wants to get involved with this. So uh, <laughs> that's what's happening. Uh, I'm gonna, we're yeah. getting ready to schedule within the next month. We'll probably start basics. And I'm hoping the timing is what I want it to be. I didn't really want a record of mine so long. Uh, I think it's the time. Go you've record. been you've been around like, with a, a lot of bands, so I think it's time for well, you. What I'm saying is, is, I didn't want to come out when I can't tour on it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to do it when I can't tour on it because, you know, that's the meat and potatoes. You know, delivering a record and then going out and playing it. Yes, so, being in the crowd. I don't want yeah, things more opened up. Yeah. yeah, be a little more. So. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot more tunes in the, in the guff. If this formula works, recording this, and it's mm -hmm. everything I think it's going to be, then uh, I'll just keep doing it. That's Because, amazing. Because uh, once something's in place and I got the players, that band going. You keep doing do that. it. That, that, that's, that's, amazing. that's amazing. And what can I say? We are at the end, just a message for each fan of each band slash project slash anything you have and please a message to all the people that did never listen before 80s music, catch them. Please, only you can catch these people to just take, list, listen to a little bit of 80s music that is pure, you know, with li pure lyrics, li lyrics of real life, moment of real life, not battlefield, destruction, just moments of life. Just a message to anyone in, in uh, Absolutely. the... Absolutely. I think you were... You were starting a song early in the interview. You actually had some lyrics going. Something about Ocean, something. By oceans. Yeah, yes, yeah. That was real. See, now, if that was me, I would have said, oh, excuse me, Keith, I'll be right back. Just picked up a guitar and finished the lyric. You know? <laughs> okay, so a, a, a message to your fan, our followers, and it's always a pleasure to have you in, the, in an interview with, uh, with us. Um. All right, for any of your fans, uh, if you haven't checked out the Burning Rain stuff by now, and um, there's four records, uh, I'm partial to, I like them all. They're all different records, they really are. Um, I'm partial to the third one, and uh, although okay. I really like the last one we just did. Um, but there's a, there's a big scope to the work if I had to recommend one to start with, but that'll lead you to the one we just did either way. Check out yeah. that band. Um, 
there's a lot of substance to the Burning Rain Band. You know, I know that I feel maybe has its own identity and wasn't exactly the sound of any of the other bands from the 80s. You know, it's 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 got its own thing, which I think is kind of cool. And I've always thought that. So um, please check out Burning Rain and uh, let Ada know if, uh, if you Don't worry, to. I will push people to listen them. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the St. John stuff that's going to come out soon. Everybody I've, that's heard it, which is very, very few people. So what can I say? But they're really that's... floored by it. Um, it's an unexpected sound. It's a little bit yeah. of a blend of something that's happened already. But I think it's in a fresh way. And, and yeah. it just it fell out of me, this new sound all of a sudden. And uh, I'm really it's liking amazing. it. And I can't wait for it to come out and for everyone to hear it. And uh, if it goes somewhere, even a, a little distance, and reaches some people and does something for their lives, I'll be very yeah. happy about that. So That's thank why you. We so, do this. so thank you so much, and I hope you to have the next interview maybe without this COVID and and speak about yeah, gigs absolutely. and album of, of your album, your own album, like uh, an uh, updating interview next time. <laughs> With new Absolutely. new stuff. And the next interview won't be divided by oceans. No, yeah. We'll fly and we'll fly. There will be an a song speaks about oceans. I will keep it in mind. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Jones, and really it was a pleasure Absolutely. again. I will send you anything about the interview and uh, it's always a pleasure and thanks for keeping the spirits of that amazing period alive. Thank you really. And thank you. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. See you soon. Look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Bye, kids. Bye.